Welcome to the Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. Thomas Miller here. Boy, do I have an episode for you. Before we get started on this one, I wanted to just reflect on the last one, episode 323, where we talked about this lady's response to a Joe Dispenza event. Boy, has that really triggered some comments. As I am recording this, I'm going to be talking with Caroline Horn this afternoon for the next episode, and she and I will talk about that a little bit. She had some interesting thoughts on it. It seems to be a topic that a lot of us are dealing with, and I say a lot of us putting myself right in there as well. Now, this story just happened. I mean, this is fresh hot off the press, and it is something that is going to just encapsulate about everything that we talk about on here in one way or another, and probably stuff that you deal with all the time. So I hope there are some good lessons in here, and let's just jump in. So as you know, I have this Sprinter van that I truly thought I would be traveling around and then realized, well, that's not going to happen. I didn't want to get rid of it yet, but where I am in North Carolina is up on the side of a mountain, basically, and there's just not any space for it to be parked up here. So I had it in a storage unit, and there's one covered storage unit within, I don't know, a bunch of miles from here, and it's about 10 or 12 minutes down the road. Actually, I was lucky to get a spot there because it filled up after I took the last one they had. And it was a locally owned business by a lady that had been there for 20 years. And if you look at the reviews online, they're all great. It just was a good situation. When I left to go to Florida, I had a decision. And this is where the first little glimpse of lesson comes in. I could have either gotten a taxi service, and I'll tell you, there are no Ubers up here, and there are very few taxis. So that would that one had a little dilemma to it. Or I thought, well, the easiest thing would be just drive the Jeep there and leave it, and then it will be there when I get back, and, you know, on I go about my way. Well, that decision, as I look back on it now, I questioned it, <laughs> this is ever so slightly, I mean ever so slightly, But I questioned it from a way of that the answer was right there. Because if I had just taken the taxi and left the Jeep up here at my place, none of this would have happened. But then we wouldn't have had this podcast either. (laughs) So I don't know. I guess I had to take one for the team. So I decided to leave the Jeep there. In January, while I was actually at the Tampa RV show, my phone rang. And it was a local area code up here, and nobody knows my number except people that would be calling for some kind of business. I don't get, you know, random calls up here. Well, I answered, and they said, your storage bill is past due. I'm like, oh, well, it shouldn't be because I I knew it wasn't the lady that I dealt with because she just always did the auto pay and sent me a letter in the mail. It was old school. So I said, well, I'm on auto pay. And they said, well, we're the new owners The storage unit has sold, we're the new owners, and we didn't carry the auto pays forward. So they said again, your bill is past due. (laughs) Like it's all about the bill, not the process. So I, obviously, I just stopped and said, okay, hang on a second, we can fix this. And I uh, got the credit card and we took care of it. But I could tell enough just from that phone conversation that this was not going to be good. This was not integrous. I could tell that there was something behind what they were doing. There was something else they had going on. And that was just reading the energy. Here were some of the clues. For one, they were scripted. This lady could not have ad-libbed her way out of a paper bag. If she wasn't on her little script, she didn't know what to say. It was also not personal. Your bill is passed due. You're just another unit on another block. and you know, If we don't get paid, then we're going to confiscate all your stuff kind of thing. And then, and I'll cut a lot of this story out here because it's just frivolous details, but there were several other conversations that I had with him and they would promise things and not, (laughs) that ding on the phone was a solar flare. (laughs) Have we not been talking about that? Okay, we'll turn the phone off. No more solar flare alerts, at least to interrupt the podcast. But they would say things and not deliver on them. 
And I'm going to tell you something, and I know we have to live in a world of deception and lies, and the whole thing is just so baked in. But when people don't hold up to their word, that's one of your biggest energy clues right there. Just realize what you're dealing with. And the other thing that they would do is just say things that were impossible. Like they were trying to give me the combination to get into the, where the Jeep was, and they were trying to give me a keypad. You know, hit pound. It's a combination lock with four characters. They didn't even know what they had on the gate. The previous owner moved out without telling anybody. There was no letter, no notification. And what was even more strange is I saw her multiple times before I left town as I was loading the Jeep, and we always would wave or say something or say hi, and she never said, oh, by the way, had she said that, I would have left the Jeep at home, absolutely. You know, like, okay, I'll hold my space, but let's see what this new owner is going to be like. But she didn't say a thing. So that was another just little weird oddity to this. So right after the first phone call, my radar was up. I mean, big time, all based on energy. And I mean, this is, guys, if you have not listened to levels of energy, I know I say this a lot. That is the most life transformative book. And not even just that low energies uh, are anger and uh, aggression and greed and fear and all this. And high energies are love and peace. And then there's a big scale in between. It tells you how this stuff works. So what I had was a low energy alert without further proof. Could it have flipped and gone high energy or could it have flipped and at least gone above 200 to apathy? Eh, possibly, like where it's just normal. I mean, a storage unit doesn't have a high level of inherent energy. It's just there. It's a 200s kind of thing. Well, that's all I wanted was a 200s kind of place. Just be average, just be normal, just work. I didn't want angelic choirs singing hymns when I came into the <laughs> to place to get the van, you know? And that's the scale of energy. You just realize this is what it is, but it was broken from that minute. And all of a sudden, it notched down the scale. So I knew, standing in Tampa, Florida, that I needed to get the Jeep out of there as soon as possible. I had this house-sitting commitment, and I didn't want to break that, but I did talk to Steve, and I told him what the issue was, and we had a plan B, and he knew fully, very much aware that I may have to cut bait and bail. And then I did some muscle testing. So here was the next thing. I was in Ormond Beach with my brother, and we were spending that precious time together that we talked about on Level Up and in the Facebook group particularly but we were just having an amazing time connecting as brothers, doing fun things. And then all of a sudden, another email comes from these people, and it shook me. I mean, I was visibly shaken when I had to deal with this. And we were having breakfast one morning, and what it led to was a conversation with my brother, who is a very good Virgo and has good advice and is a lot less reactive than I am, was just saying, look, play it out. Maybe they're, you know, give it a little time. I was ready to just literally pack up the van and head north and just say, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to get that Jeep out so that I can sleep at night and then I'll come back down. I mean, it's a 10 hour drive each way. So I'm like, oh, this is a lot. Plus you rack miles up on a vehicle like what I have there and you depreciate it. Every mile is less value. But I did some muscle testing there and the muscle testing said, don't go back. You don't have to. It was okay. So I stayed. I got re-present, <laughs> re-centered, and stayed in there with my brother and then went back to Tampa for the house-sitting gig. All right. So now Tampa is going okay. Haven't heard from the people. Everything's quiet. So I decided to go to Dallas to see my kids and grandkids. I was going to leave the van in Tampa and fly to Dallas. It just a lot easier than making that big, long, thousand-mile journey. But ahead of the Dallas trip, probably about a week, I started to get progressively uneasy about going on that trip. I didn't know if it was the flying that was making me uneasy or if you know there might have been something in the 
universe that was getting ready to happen or whatever, but I just had an unease in there. And that was another clue that right there, I should have canceled the event, but the universe stepped in and David got sick. The girls were already sick. His wife was next, obviously. So after several discussions and David very much respecting what I do and how illness takes me off the court, basically, we decided together to cancel the trip. In fact, basically, it was his decision. He said, Dad, I don't think you should come. If you can get your money back from everything, then we should just postpone this. All right, so here's another crossroads. Now the house-sitting gig is finished. Where am I going to go next? I mean, it was not even uh, an issue. I had such a pressing desire, need, pull, (laughs) whatever you want to call it, to go back to North Carolina that I just set the compass north. I did confirm with a muscle test, and that just felt right. The muscle test confirmed it, and off I go. What was about maybe three or four hours into the 12-hour drive from the Tampa side, I get a phone call, and it's them. Dum, da, dum, dum, <laughs> dum, 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 dum. They play the Darth Vader music, you know, whenever they come in, when Darth Vader came in the room. Here we are. Now what they want is all this personal information about the vehicle that I have parked on their property. Well, they wanted the VIN number, my license plate. I mean, that's fine. You can go see that. They wanted my driver's license number and my date of birth. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, I realized what was going on. And eventually it was proven out when I asked them to, uh, by the way, do you have a lease for this that you could send me? They hadn't sent me a, a lease that was in effect. Oh, yes, yes. So they emailed it to me. And right there in big, bold letters at the very beginning of the lease, it talks about how everything that you have on their property is subject to a lien if you don't pay your bill. And I get it. I know. That's the storage business. I totally understand. I probably would have the same if I owned a storage unit. But that was their exclusive focus. And I think what this company is, they don't have a physical address. There's just all kinds of funny stuff about it. In fact, they gave me two post office box numbers of how to contact them. It's just this whole thing was slimy. I said, well, look, I'm driving. I can't get all that together right now. Could we talk tomorrow? Would you call me back tomorrow? Yeah, what time? Uh, In the afternoon. I was buying time here. (laughs) And ask them again. I said, oh, by the way. I was out of town when you took the storage unit over, and I never got any information on how we access the unit. And they said, oh, it's it's the same. It's the same. I knew that wasn't going to be right either, and it wasn't. So I got back home, went straight to the storage unit on my way in, got back late at night, and the lock had been changed. What had been just a key lock now was a four-digit padlock. So I started calling them about how am I going to get in. And the bottom line of this piece of the story is they didn't know. And it took three phone calls to get to that point of them admitting, we don't know the number to give you, to get in, to get your car. Now, here's the part of this where you know things have shifted in your life when dot, dot, dot. When you're put in the pressure cooker like this and you respond differently then you know that change has really permeated your existence, your life. The old me, I know, would have been A, freaking out, B, upset and wanting revenge. I would have been wanting to get back at these people. Typical Scorpio characteristic, actually. It would have affected my body. My muscles would have been tense. My heart rate would have been increased. And just I would have been reacting to the whole situation and in nowhere in there creating. So as I went back the next morning to get the spring the Jeep out, the first thing I did was muscle test. And I got to tell you, I could tell as I was asking the questions and I always ask permission. May I ask about this? And it said the muscle testing was off bottom line. And it was off because I was a little bit uncentered. I knew it, and yet I did the muscle testing. Well, 
the answers that I got were not correct. The other thing I did was some commanding. So I commanded the lock to be gone. I, I commanded the lock to basically fall off of the gate and for the gate to swing open. And that, when I got there, was not the case. It was very locked up and very quiet. <laughs> this place did not have a manager on site. Nobody. It's completely virtually managed now. So the muscle testing didn't work. The commanding didn't work. And that was because I was not centered. So the other question that I asked myself was, WWFD, what would Fred do? And I knew that Fred would be calm, so I worked on that. I knew that he would command, so I had already done that. The other thing that he would do is he would have looked away. He would have gotten his attention off of the situation. So I had about a 10-minute drive over there from where I was, and I put on some banjo music. <laughs> I'm like, welcome home. I put on dueling banjos with Roy Clark and Buck Trent from Hee Haw. Okay, now that's how dated this is. <laughs> but look, I'm back in North Carolina. I wanted to brighten the fact that I was back in North Carolina. There's so much clogging that goes on around here, and it's kind of become a big deal. There was this local guy that was on the Country Music Awards show this past uh, last year that really set the thing on fire doing this little quick clog dance and uh, became quite popular around here. So I did all of that in order to just brighten me up locally. I'm glad to be back. I'm here. Let's get this done so I can move on. And it got my mind off of the storage unit. So for the 10-minute drive, I was cranking banjo music the whole way. One other thing that I remembered was that the Jeep was given to me miraculously. It was as I had just started this change in my life, realizing that I am a powerful creator. I manifested that Jeep. That Jeep was an answer to prayer. That Jeep was an answer to my vision. That Jeep was given to me in a very special way at a very special time. And I knew that the chances of it being taken away just by some low-energy entity that claims some kind of thing that whatever, I just, you know, I just uh, was like, no, that's not how this is going to go. But when I got there, it was locked up. And once again on the phone, they could not produce any way to access it. So I was basically boxed in. At that point, there were no present answers to getting the Jeep out, especially today. All right. Now you're dealing with a Scorpio <laughs> uh, who has Mars and Neptune right there together on the sun. In other words, somebody who's not going to just sit by and wait for them to figure this out. There's getting ready to be some action, and it's going to be some massive action. So I went back to the storage place, and I started analyzing the situation. Is there any way that I can get in here without damaging their property? Well, there was. The gate, just a chain-link fence gate, was bolted to a pole with these four bolts that I thought, hmm, if I could get those loose, then I could pop this gate off, swing it open, Go get the Jeep out, swing it back closed, put the bolts back on, and they wouldn't either A, no, there was a camera there, but I have reason to think it was disconnected, or B, the, you know, the, I mean, there's no property damage. How would they even see that I had done what I did? And in my mind, if I have a legal right to enter that property, and it just so happens that they have a lock there that they can't tell me how to open, but I have a wrench that I could use to open the other side. What's the difference in using the wrench as access versus dialing in a, a four-code combination on a padlock? I'm not damaging their property. I'm not doing anything illegal. I have documents that say that I have right to access that. What's the difference? I mean, I'm not destroying anything. But if that camera was working and they called the police, then I obviously would have that to deal with. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the police station and just tell them, here's the situation. 
Well, they couldn't, the police couldn't see past the fact that I was trespassing by taking the gate apart. They thought that was equal to trespassing. I'm like, no, no, it's not. So I didn't get very far there. Next thing was, I better get some legal advice. If I'm going to do this, I better at least know on what ground I stand if I'm going to risk going to jail to get my Jeep out of this place. So I made an appointment, 4 p.m. Guy could meet with me. Had my list, went back, got something to eat, rested up, got re- recharged for the afternoon shift and what might have gone into the evening. And I went back to the storage unit and I was going to shoot some video to put on YouTube. Before it got dark, I wanted to do a little bit of setup of what the situation was, show the gate, show the fence, show what I was thinking to do, show the Jeep in there, etc. This is 30 minutes now before I was supposed to go basically a mile up the road to meet with this attorney at the top of the hour. And as I was again looking at the situation and deciding that, okay, if unless this guy tells me don't absolutely don't do that, then that's what I was going to do probably later that evening after it got dark. I was going to wait because there was basically other than that camera nobody that would be going by there that would care what i was doing it was impossible to see from the street so i would have been back there by myself as i was getting ready to pull the video gear out and start shooting a guy pulls up in of all things (laughs) a jeep not my kind of jeep it was more like a caravan or cherokee or something like that a jeep suv And he had the combination to the gate. He told me what it was. I went over and opened the lock, swung the gate open a few hours later than I'd hoped, and drove the Jeep out. I'm going to tell you what the man said at the end, but let's hit a couple of lessons because you never want to leave a good story like this without taking a few things away. Number one... The huge benefit of remaining calm. This is what I've observed from Fred Dodson, who has calmed himself to where in crisis he doesn't get excited because you see why. The gate came down on the answers, the inspiration, the effectiveness of commanding everything shut down because I was just across the line. I wasn't that far across the line And I wasn't across the line externally at all. It was all internally, but I wasn't completely calm. And this is why we have to maintain that state all the time. It's the same thing as I talk about when we talk about not changing your state through substances. Because when you change your state, often, not always, often, it brings the gate down for a while, while the substance is influencing. Same thing here. We have to remain calm, and that's a big lesson to somebody who is not born to be calm. Here was another big question I asked myself. How did I enter this negative energy? I mean, I was doing my thing. I was down there in Florida. We'd met with my brother already. I'd met with Cheryl. I was getting ready to, or I'd seen Sean and Brielle. I was getting ready to do this wonderful house-sitting thing. It's like there was nothing negative going on at that time. Everything was in order. Business was in order. I was feeling good. How all of a sudden did this negative thing happen? And I know some of your stories, and I know that some very, like the ultimate negative has happened to some of you. And that you're not in that energy to draw it in. Well, I still don't have the answer to that. Still working on it. Still doing a lot of journaling. I'll get back with you when I know more. But it certainly is a motivator for me to stay on my A-game energetically all the time. Another takeaway for me is, and this is just universally true principle anywhere, it is always best, if possible, to exit a low-energy situation as soon as possible. Unless you are told to stay, very clearly told to stay, Nothing good comes from low energy. Low energy attracts negative results. It attracts conflict. It attracts delays. It attracts deceptions. It attracts everything that you don't want to have around you. So the best thing to do is remaining calm, get it 
off your plate as fast as you can, step around it, and go on. And I think coupled with that is also realizing that we are always being guided by situations as much as anything else, as much as muscle testing or as much as synchronicity. Situations are synchronicities. So never be afraid, back to the previous point, of asking why something showed up. Sometimes we might have to wait for the lessons. But keep going deep to look for the answers, and that's what I'm going to do. There was a reason for this in there somewhere. And the other thing is, as I have done this a lot, those of you who are keeping up with us on Level on level Up on Sundays and whatnot, is that I am opening my life every day to miracles, to a re-examination of spirituality, to a re-examination of my relationship with God. A lot that was discussed earlier in the episodes of this podcast when I was shaking my fist at heaven is softening a lot. So when 30 minutes away from the appointment with the attorney to possibly be willing to go up there and get arrested and spend the night or two or three in jail, this guy showed up. And what he said as we shook hands and said goodbye, and we were talking back and forth, he knew my story. He knew the situation. He said, wow, well, the Lord must have sent me up here this afternoon In good old southern drawl slang, I said, Amen, brother, (laughs) and thanked him again. You know, scattered all through the Bible are stories of locked gates falling off. So don't ever omit, forget, or not acknowledge God's help, divine help, highest sources help when we need that miracle. I'm going to imprint this story in the memory of my mind as one of those top episodes where God came through, source provided. This is one I'm going to choose to not forget and hopefully remain a little more calm next time. And I hope there's something in here that helps you too. The bottom line for me, learn energy and follow it. We'll see you next time to talk to Caroline Horn, and then we're going to go back and explore the topic of the last podcast in greater depth. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Thomas Miller. Enjoy the journey.